Hi, everyone. We're just going to give everyone a minute to settle in. Thank you for joining our session today, Marketing Matchmaking, Three Steps to Finding Your Best Leads. I'm Susie Balk, your moderator today, and I'm excited to share what we have in store for you. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. First, this webinar is being recorded and you'll receive an email with a link to the recording within 48 hours after we conclude today. Keep an eye on your inbox. Second, we'll be taking questions throughout the presentation. So if one pops up, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box on the Zoom webinar dashboard. I encourage you to reserve your questions for the Q&A box versus posting them in the chat. Uh, sometimes they get buried throughout the presentation in the chat box and I wanna make sure uh, we can see them. Uh, lastly, there is a brief survey at the conclusion of this webinar and we would love to get your feedback on today's session and how we can improve this experience for you in the future. And with that, let's welcome today's presenters, Dom and Deeksha. Dom, you want to go ahead and kick things off? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm Dom. I'm the director of demand gen here at Acton. I currently see oversee all of our demand gen activities. Uh, if I had to simplify my role into one key focus, it's definitely just, just pipeline. Um, I've worked on both sides of, of go to market, so both sales and marketing. So I'm really excited today in today's topics because uh, Got, I've been on the receiving end of, of lead scoring as well as uh, on the side of building. So um, it's always an interesting topic to me. Um, I'm excited to do this with Dom. Um, I am Deeksha Taneja. I'm the director, uh, senior director of growth and optimization, part of Zoom Info Marketing team. I look after demand gen, paid search, as well as marketing analytics. And in my current role, I am always looking to optimize uh, my lead funnel, um, drive efficient uh, marketing programs, and I leverage like data infrastructure analytics and reporting to do all of that. Uh, MQLs, if anybody knows me, knows is my favorite topic. So I'm excited to be here to talk to talk about it with Dom uh, and yeah, share my wisdom, a little bit of it. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for introducing yourselves. Um, let's transition into a quick rundown of today's session. So here's what we'll cover how to recognize the signs for when it's time to change your lead scoring strategy, how to convince your leadership team that quality over quantity is better in the long run, and how to regularly anticipate and adjust your lead scoring strategy. But before we get started, we have a quick poll uh, just to see the breakdown of our audience today and make sure we touch on points for everyone. Nice. So, you know, for do we currently use lead scoring? Most of us are at yes, a couple at no. Are you unsure what best defines your company's lead scoring strategy? A couple people using behavioral scoring or only demographic. A lot of you using a combination. And then, of course, some of us not using lead scoring. I'll go ahead and share those with you. Great. And without further ado, we can jump right in um, and we're going to talk about lead scoring strategy. So our first question. What is your current lead score strategy at Acton and Zoom Info, respectively? Um, I can take this one first. Um, before actually I go into like the strategy piece, I just want to level set by saying, what is the intent of lead scoring? In a sense, we are trying to attach a value to the leads that you're requiring. So we are better enabled to work them and push them through the funnel. 
Um, it's also a measure that you typically use to kind of find a balance between the quality and the quantity of leads that are coming through your funnel, uh, as well as the readiness of those. Um, for us at Zoom Info, we have like the three main inputs to our lead scoring. Formographic, which is primarily your, you know, company related information, company size, industry, segment, location, all of that good stuff. Then we look look at demographic, which is the individual who's engaging with us. So what is their job role? What is their persona? What is their title? What is their influence or the you know, management level where they are? And those two things that you're looking at, firmographic and demographic, often could be you know, acquired when you're doing the form fills or the information that you're collecting on your website. But you could also enhance and append it using you know, Zoom Info data or other data vendors that are out there. You can enhance them to get that additional information. The third thing that we use is the intent, which is driven primarily by you know, behavior or what they are engaging with. So are there specific campaigns that they're engaging with, whether it's corporate website versus some not branded campaigns versus display. And if they're engaging with on the website, are they engaging with the pricing page versus just a home page, right? Each one of them could mean different things depending on how and where they're engaging and what, what content they're engaging with. Another thing that we take into consideration from intent is, you know, um, email engagement. Did you read an email? Did you come back to the website multiple times? The frequency of the actions that you're taking, right? Uh, pricing, you know, having one action could have higher value, but reading an email and showing constant in interest in ours, like things that we are throwing at you could also be cumulatively a good indicator or intent of where you are in your buying journey. So leveraging all of these three, you know, scores or the three inputs, we use historical win rates as well as whatever our company goals are for, for the year uh, that we're trying to drive through, combine all of them. And that's how we, uh, that is our like lead scoring strategy and methodology that we leverage for our, um, yeah, for ourselves. Great. Thanks, Disha. Um, we act on, we have a pretty similar premise to the way we do our lead scoring. And I saw 45% of y'all in the poll don't, don't have a lead scoring strategy. So shameless plug of act on, um, you can use us to do it, to build it yourself. <laughs> um, but to, to, to kick it off for, for our end, uh, we, we actually combine our firmographic and demographic components. So, um, rather than assigning values to each individual, um, component that Diksha mentioned, such as the their job persona title um, in industry and location. Uh, what we're doing is we do still do that, uh, but we use that to put them into specific buckets, which will get a, additions to their lead score based on which bucket they get into. So if they have all like the perfect ICP fit, the, they'll get a higher point score than someone who has a couple pieces um, of, of a good fit from an ICP perspective. And then the people who don't necessarily fit very well won't get any additional points for the firmographic and demographic component. Um, and we do that just because uh, a lot of times it's it's hard to determine what, what a manager should look like versus a director in terms of scoring. So it, th things like that um, are simplified in, in this approach. Um, and then like using a, a data provider like Zoom Info to, to get that additional layering, because most people aren't capturing all the data you need for this portion of your model in your forms, uh, is what gets you to that next level of, of having all of the data points at least populated so you can have a more informed model as you're building it out. Um, and then the second piece, um, just like Deeksha does with the intent, we, we have an engagement component as well, and it's definitely weighted a lot heavier than our than our uh, ICP component. Um, so form fills are a big piece for here. I think anybody filling out a form are making more of a commitment to, to, to your company than simply visiting a page or looking at an email, stopping by your booth at an event and grabbing candy. Um, I'm sure anybody who's gone to events is guilty of letting people scan their badge because they want whatever they're handing out. So um, we, we definitely score forms quite a bit higher than we do um, other types of engagement with our with our content. Uh, visiting specific web pages, um, Deeksha mentioned like pages like pricing and demo requests are going to be weighted a little bit heavier than someone who's simply looking at the homepage. Um, so building your scoring to to look at the different pages as how close they are to being sales ready and scoring accordingly is, is really important. Um, and then finally, the engagement with, with what you're promoting. So clicking on ads, um, clicking on emails. We don't score on opens just because um, if you're like me, I like having a perfectly clean inbox. So I will go and open all of my emails and then archive them immediately. Um, so we we don't score on opens solely because I'm sure I'm not the only one who does that, but um, we, we are looking for other other levels of engagement and scoring accordingly. Um, that's, that's, that's what I got for that. Yeah, really good. Um, 
And then how are you continually evaluating your lead scoring strategy? When are the signs and what are the signs it's time to pivot? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll start that with, with when. Uh, I think any, any organization should have a regular cadence to review this. Uh, it doesn't have to be um, like, I don't have an exact amount of time. I think we, we type typically like to look at it at least monthly, but it's also something that you're constantly monitoring. It's not a set and forget type of motion. Um, maybe initially as you're, as you're building things out, because you need to get some volume through the model to get anything to do an analysis on. Um, but it is important to have a scheduled cadence for this, um, and not make too many changes at once, uh, just because of the law of any, any type of testing, if you're changing too many variables, you're not going to know which ones are making what impact. Uh, another times large GDM shifts, uh, Deeksha can, can attest to the fact that zoom info has made several acquisitions over the last few years, <laughs> every time that brings a new ICP, a new package that they can offer. So whenever you do something like that, um, and it doesn't have to just be acquisition, it could be just repackaging your product, or maybe you introduce a, a new, um, feature to your solution. Like that's a good time to, to address your lead scoring model and, and make sure that you're accommodating the, the potential new ICP that's coming in, as well as the new companies that might be uh, a good fit for you after that shift. Um, and then the last one for when is definitely when conversion rates are sinking. Um, mm -hmm. This is a big one. If, if, if you're going from a 20% conversion rate and it's just trending down for over the course of a period of time, like you need to address the problem. And a lot of times this lead scoring can help you identify where, where you're, where you're starting to see that loss. Um, and then jumping into how there's a million ways to, <laughs> to build your lead scoring model. I think a, a good one to start, especially for those of you who don't have anything built out currently is looking at your um, your historical ops that have been created uh, to do like a win-loss analysis. Uh, and I, I, I urge you to be careful of relying solely on this um, because if you're only looking at what's worked before, you're not going to find any new opportunities. So it's something that will steer you but not be like your be-all, ends-all for your, for your model. Um, and then also looking at not just the first entry points within these accounts, but the buying committee that you end up with by the end of the opportunity. So that you're not just considering who you started with, but who gets looped in at any point during the service or the process. Um, other one is building a feedback loop. Uh, we use we use our CRM to let our whenever our SDRs are getting leads, like they have a very clear and and concise process to disqualify things that they don't fit our ICP, and we use that information to inform our model. Um, and then the last one I'll dig into is definitely looking at macroeconomics. Um, look at looking at COVID, like. COVID was a hard time for a ton of industries, but then there are industries like virtual comms and collaboration companies like Zoom, for instance, that saw a huge boom. Um, and any any macroeconomic shift is going to have some people that are facing headwinds, and then you're going to have people who are facing tailwinds. And you want to focus as much as possible on the people that we know are going to be able to spend uh, in in a state of uncertainty. Um, yeah, Deeksha, I'd love to hear hear what else you're, yeah. you're looking at here. A lot of what you said uh, hits home for us as well, right? Like, um, when, when do you change it? Um, for us, like we're obsessed with data at Zoom Info. Like we are looking at that on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Uh, and the best way to know when to change is to have like a very close tabs as to what is working and what is not working. So um, on an ongoing basis, monitoring the performance of the leads through the funnel using our current methodology uh, kind of helps you give that visual. And you can then on an ongoing basis see the conversion rates or the typical metrics that you that were once working, are they working now or not? Um, what I'd also want to say is at Zoom Info um, or at any other companies where I've worked, right? Like you're, we're always looking at the lowest common denominator. You're always looking to optimize your model because let, we can always get better. Um, so there are two ways when you're like looking at it. One of them is you have your current scoring and you're basically just adjusting your thresholds of scoring. So let's say if you have scoring from 100 to 0, 100 being best, 0 being less, and earlier you would send everything that was above 70. And while you're not changing the inputs of it, you're just saying, because of the volume that I'm getting or because of the things that I'm seeing in the marketplace, maybe I'm going to increase it to you know, 80. And 80 and the above, I haven't changed the inputs, I'm just sending anything that's 80 and above using my current scoring, or could lower it depending on that. Another way of uh, looking at this, or which kind of what you touched upon, Dom, was as well, is changing the inputs of the model itself. So do I start scoring something differently now, a company or let's say mid-market or enterprise, right? If I want to kind of go more up market, I, do I start scoring them heavier, giving them higher scores? So by default, my scoring is now adjusted to be more aligned with where I want to go as a company and hence kind of like pushes me on that path. So when you're changing, it could be a, a 
function of where you are, are you just part of like ongoing optimization or you're changing it because the way your goals or the way you're headed has changed. Another thing that you talked about, Tom, which is absolutely right. Like when you do like different acquisitions or you do new product launches, you're going into different industries, your ICP would change. And sometimes using historical data is not a good enough measure to kind of say, this is how I want to have this coding for something new. And at that point, it may warrant for you to, you know, change change that model or reevaluate the model that we have. Um, yeah, like, so how how would you do it? Like, as I said, like, I, either you're changing the, the threshold. So the threshold changing could be as simple as, you know, I work with the marketing operations team or I work with the, with the operations team that can help me, like, you know, readjust those thresholds. It doesn't change the input. We are just going to, like, do differently, different treatments to them. Um, what you would also want to do is, uh, you know, at any given point, you'd want to also understand, like, when you're making these changes, you are using, uh, you know, correct data to evaluate if they're going to perform at the same level as you expected at the modeling stage. Um, sometimes when we have made some changes to our scoring model, um, we would rather than like pushing it live in production, we would always have like a parallel model running where we can see live data off with this new model to say if it is performing as expected in the live, you know, um, because every sometimes data looks great on, on paper. And when you start put it, put it live with like the sales team and the different motions that you have, um, it kind of like behaves differently. So Again, like depending on which what changes you're doing, that could totally like push you on how you go about changing those models, whether it's just the threshold or just changing the scoring within like um, different inputs that you have. Yeah, really good insight there from both of you. Thank you. Um, and I just want to do a quick uh, check in and reminder that uh, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. We'll have time at the end. I see a couple coming through. So really great to see that. Um, and without further ado, we will continue to our next topic, which is prioritizing quality MQLs. And the first thing we're going to talk about is how do you convince your leadership team that quality over quantity is better in the long run? Great. I, I can kick off this one. So to start off, uh, I, I want to make sure it's clear that this doesn't mean quantity is not important. Uh, it's just that focusing there at the expense of quality um, is, go is going to do more harm than benefit. I think I always like to use use the math of if you pass over 100 leads that convert at 20%, getting you 20 demos, uh, that's more valuable than passing over 200 leads that convert at 10%, getting the same amount of meetings, because the time spent on those 200 leads is going to be more than 100 and you get the same results. So um, again, uh, it kind of kind of jumps into the first thing that I like to, to talk about is highlighting the opportunity cost of perhaps wasting time on leads that are never going to convert. Um, rather than increasing engagements with high quality leads. Again, if, if you're spreading your reps too thin, not only are they wasting time on leads that might not convert, but they're also taking time away from the ones that if you were making adjustments to your model accordingly are are, are the best fits for you. Um, the other piece is uh, like once you refine your model, you can always come back and make adjust adjustments. I think there there is a it's not uncommon for people to overcorrect as they make adjustments on their model because you see something's not working and you want to remove that from the from the equation. Um, but just because that happens, it doesn't mean you can't roll it back. Um, and you always will still have the records and system. Um, it's not it's not the cleanest way, but it's it is okay for that to happen. Like you don't need to let out your or create this model that works forever, and that's not never the intention, anyways. Um, and then the last thing is is mapping out how many MQL uh, MQLs your sales team can actually effectively work, um, and what conversion rate you need to hit on those to reach your bottom of funnel targets. Um, we we actually just we did this this le or, uh, exercise not too long ago where we have our bottom of funnel targets for the year and are trying to figure out how many leads and MQLs we need to get there. So doing that that math and that work to to figure that out um, is it makes the conversation much more smooth with your leadership team because it's not we're not we we can't we can't hit fifteen hundred leads because we don't want to or because we don't think it's going to work. It's we don't need fifteen hundred leads to do this. If we convert at a higher rate, we can do that with. 1200 leads or whatever that number looks like for your for your specific org. So do the math uh, and uh, re rely on leads and MQLs as levers to reach those bottom line KPIs rather than them being your your final uh, final goal. Yeah, 100%. I think data is your best friend in all of this, like when you have to convince, right? Like you have to kind of show it with data. And uh, 
And if you're communicating the performance of the leads and by the scoring that you've set on an ongoing basis, it's less about convincing them and more about creating a path to the suggested change by showing the impact of that change, right? So like Dom mentioned, you're talking about the opportunity cost. There is also, there is an opportunity cost of not doing it, but there could also be a cost of if we did do that and if mm -hmm. things don't go as expected, this is what would be the loss potential loss that we're looking at, and this is how we would mitigate it. Uh, a good example of that would be, you know, let's say if you have threshold of 80 to 100, and those are the leads that you're throwing, you know, to the next, to the sales team, and they convert at like 50%, and you find out that there is a cohort that converts at 60%. However, not that the one before was not converting at all. So when you start like, you know, throttling that, you'd say, of course, we will gain more on the capacity side, which by default, will hopefully increase the conversion rate enough to combat the, the impact or the downstream like uh, revenue loss that would happen with these changes. Creating those uh, ba barriers or guardrails of what we need to achieve for this to be a success kind of makes it easier for you to like create that path to success. And I think in all of this, one of the biggest things at least that I've learned is having that sales and marketing alignment. Because at the end of the day, whatever we do on the marketing end, eventually if it does not work well with the way sales is working them or adjusting their tactics or their talk tracks, like there is no way you're going to see success in any of these motions. So going in as you know one voice uh, between sales and marketing and coming up with a plan that works for the greater good within the organization and getting to the to the actual like revenue number is what is going to make it like easier for you to convince the leadership and kind of getting their buy-in to really go ahead and make the change. Also, like Dom said, like it's not about like you go in and make all of the changes at all at once, right? Like you start small, you start testing it out, prove that the methodology that you're pushing on or the changes that you're pushing on will actually, you know, drive the impact that you're you're looking to get, uh, and that kind of can also give you that confidence as well as your build your case to make like greater changes and push it through the organization. Um, from data points perspective, like you know, it's always a balance of quality uh, and quantity. So when we make this change, is it actually going to increase the volume or is it going to decrease the volume? Um, and to make this change, another thing that you always have to consider is how much effort is it, right? Like how are your systems built? What goes into these things? So while on paper I can say, I want to start sending these leads or stop sending these leads, are your operations partners ready to make those changes, equipped to make those changes on, an, on a quicker basis for you to see that impact? So always having that effort and impact balance and kind of using that as also a lever to kind of go to your leadership team to get their buy-in kind of helps you like build your case. Yeah, again, really good insight. Um, thank you both for sharing. And then of course, let's talk about how do you get cross-functional feedback and buy-in from your scoring model? What team should you get involved? Um, I can continue on this one if you are okay with that, Dom. So like I just touched upon, like sales alignment is, I think, one of the first, like one of the keys in this thing, like if you talk about broader marketing, but somewhere I touched upon some of those things, right? Understanding, um, you know, what your goals are, what is, you know, getting a viewpoint of um, from the product team, right? Are there new things coming in the pipeline that could warrant for us to like reevaluate or really question the way we are like doing things currently? Are we expanding in different geos? Do they behave differently? broader marketing team are we expanding in certain channels that we've not done in the past have we been very like you know website focused and now i want to expand into linkedin or other places each one of them having those inputs kind of helps you um, understanding what is coming your way also gets you the feedback from those teams to understand like if it is needed for us to make any changes um, operations team is extremely important because a lot of times when you're going to ask them for these changes you know, it will be dependent on some of these teams to kind of bring that to fruition. Again, it depends on big company versus small and where, you know, where you are sitting within the organization. Um, analytics team, monitoring this data to make sure that, you know, they're on board to kind of start looking at it in a different way. Um, finance team. So, I mean, there are a lot of teams and a lot of times you just need inputs from them. A lot of times you just need more awareness provided to them. But in 
in either of them, depending on what changes you're doing, these are the typical teams that you would involve in some capacity. Again, from implementation standpoint, marketing operations, re revenue operations, and or analytics team will be heavily involved. But the number one like success for any of the things that you're doing is going to be that sales and marketing alignment. Like I, I think I personally am spending a lot of time making sure that we are constantly talking to our uh, sales counterparts because a lot of times we change messaging on the marketing side or we'll change coding on the marketing side and we think this is how we're going to do it. But if it's not communicated to the sales team, a lot of the metrics that you think are going to flow through, they don't come through and hence they will not like let you, you know, get you to the next level of changes that you'd want to push on. So uh, yeah, those are the teams that that you'd work with. Okay, thanks, Disha. And um, yeah, it, as, as Disha shared, like there's a ton of teams that can and should be involved in the process. Um, for for smaller companies like like Acton, like we don't we don't have a lot of a lot of those functions in house, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like you can do it with with less. Um, ultimately, like she shared, sales and marketing are the number one are number one. It comes to alignment. Um, so, in 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 our in our org, like typically marketing is the one that that owns building out this model, um, and we do work with a data team, or I should say, a data person to to get to uh, to get to our numbers and like what we want to do here but you do need the sales buy-in. So the marketing and sales are essentially in a lean org. Um, and then the the other one, uh, and, and Deeks touched on this as well, is product. Um, they, they can inform you about upcoming initiatives, releases that may impact your model, um, as well as if if some new product releases are going to introduce a new ICP into your market, like letting you know ahead of time so that you can start scoring for that before the release. Um, that way you're not playing catch up when it happens rather than um, being prepared and, and having everything in place so that you can go go to market more effectively as soon as things launch because nobody likes to uh, be putting pushing away leads that are actually pretty good fits when they when they could be working them because yeah the speed to lead is important. Um, I know zoom info lives by that and we're we're living by that as well. Um, and the last piece uh, that I want to add here is just like um, in order to get that feedback and, and buy in from the scoring model like you need to be as have as little gut driven decisions as possible. If you're starting from scratch, like that might be a good starting place and that's fine. But when you do get the data in uh, into your system and people are starting to flow through your, your lead scoring model in your funnel, you need to readdress that and, and pull that data to, to make make adjustments and make sure that you are um, again, you're not relying on your gut because the gut lies data does not. Yeah, wise words to leave us with, Tom, on that topic. Um, and then I think, you know, our, our final topic and maybe the most important one when it comes to data and making data-driven decisions is uh, testing and optimization. Uh, so with that being said, how do you regularly anticipate and adjust your lead scoring strategy? Totally. Um, I'll, I'll kick us off with this one, but... Uh... Uh, we covered a lot of this already in previous questions. I think the big thing is whenever you're making shifts, you need to you need to have your reports and uh, process in place to be able to monitor what these shifts look like. Um, and it's not just looking at the lead scoring model as a whole, but looking at the individual characteristics that you're making adjustments to. If you're adding a new great fit industry, you should have a report that's looking at the leads that are coming in with this industry and monitor down funnel performance. You're adding a new perform or a new persona. Um, you want to look at what engagement looks like for these individuals and how many of them actually move beyond the MQL stage. Because um, even if your lead to MQL rate is good on a new persona, it doesn't necessarily mean that the sales team is having any success with them. I think one thing you'll see that is like, um, and with our current macroeconomic trends that we're seeing, CFOs are increasingly being involved in, in decision making, even if it's not a finance specific project. Uh, and, and because of that, they're likely going to be buying committee members on, on large purchases nowadays. But it doesn't necessarily mean you want to work a CFO as as your first touch. If you're especially for us, we're selling marketing software. A CFO is generally not a great first touch, but they do get involved, and it's important to 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 score accordingly. So that if if a CFO is coming to you with this project or being involved in this, or being um, heavily engaging in your content that's related to it, like they're not a bad touch. And just again, um, always always looking at the specific changes that you're making in in. Uh, and the, the last piece I'll jump into, I know I was going off on a tangent a little bit, but uh, record the changes as they're made and, and make sure you know when they're made. That way, when you do analyze the data, you have a, a data or a, a date stamp of when you're, what, what things look like before as well as what they're looking like after. Totally, totally agree with you. I mean, I think ongoing reporting is a great way. 
and perhaps the only way to regularly anticipate the need for a change, right? Not having visibility into that is there is no way you can make any changes. Um, I think one way is like evaluate at the high level, right? You have whatever you're using, highest to lowest, 100 to zero, however your scoring is right now. If I, all things being equal, if I look at the analysis and just say highest to lowest leads, whether it's win rate or whatever metric you think, think whether it's the ACV, the ASP, whatever you're thinking is the right method for you, highest to lowest, is it following in the same pattern? Is highest performing the best and lowest performing the lowest? Like it's firstly as simple as that. Then you start, and I think oftentimes you will see that probably it follows the same pattern, but you will start finding like some pockets of it where you start seeing, well, that doesn't make sense. And that's kind of where you'd want to go back to the levers or the inputs of your model. Like, are you using firmographic data? Are you using demographic data? A combination of that and saying, are there specific cuts that are not like working as expected? Um, so having that viewpoint will help you kind of figure out like, do we need to adjust it? Can anticipate, you can anticipate on that. Another thing that, uh, you know, what I would say, like in terms of testing your model is, and this is something that I'm pushing on within organization right now, and we don't really do it right now, is by default, your lead scoring has some bias built in, right? Because when I say something is highest and it goes to the sales team, it's difficult for them to treat highest differently than lowest, right? And when they treat it differently or walk through the funnel through it, like, by default, you'll definitely get some of the goodness coming out of the fact of those biases that we're building just being part of that funnel. And the intention is that, right? If it's a high SV, I want the sales to be working them a certain way. But the intention that we have right now in terms of testing our model is to always have untreated, unscored lists, uh, uh, leads going through the system so we can coll always collect data on that to say, are there pockets that we are actually not scoring or collecting data on and would be great for us to add? Oftentimes the issue is unless you're doing a new persona, unless you're doing expansion, you're always kind of making your current model better by the data that you've already collected. What about the data that you're not collecting on any of the new persona that you would be hitting? And, and actually you're not even, it's not even on your radar. So if for a specific persona, which I didn't anticipate as my ICP, but I start them, in, they start engaging more by my current model, I would just anyway downgrade them. And having that unbiased view or unbiased unscored lead going through the funnel can also be a good way for us to always test that is our current model, like picking on all of the different like signals that I'm getting from the market. And if there is a way for me to need for me to adjust that. So there are a few ways for you to do that, but yeah, those are the couple of ways. Like the first one we do, the second one we are working on right now. Yeah, that's really interesting. You'll have to keep us posted on how that goes. <laughs> But um, our next question is, you know, what baselines and metrics do you look for at a conversion perspective? Yeah, um, I think our, our two big ones are definitely lead to MQL and MQL to SQL. Uh, lead to MQL is an obvious one. Like not every lead that you bring into your system is sales ready and is ever going to make it to sales ready. Um, so people download content because they're just generally interested in a topic. It doesn't necessarily mean they want to buy your service. Uh, and I think building that into your model and understanding that you're going to have a lot of people who come in and, and aren't necessarily worth the outreach from a sales rep is, is okay and it's healthy. Uh, and ours are the model like we're, we're aiming for about 40%. Um, I think industry average is between 40 to 50% from what I've seen, at least for our industry. Um, and it's th that number is definitely, it's like heavily controlled by your lead scoring model um, and influenced by the types of engagements you score against on the existing leads. I haven't MQL'd yet. Uh, and then looking at MQL to SQL, I think this, this shows how sales ready the leads actually are. Um, if, if you're not taking a look at this and you're just looking at lead to MQL, like that, that's a very dated way of looking at your, your lead funnel um, because it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't show the sales and marketing alignment that I think uh, both of us have, have emphasized is super important when you're building out this model. So you need to be looking at that number. Um, and if, if you're starting to see that number dip, like that's, that's a sign that, that that's probably one of the biggest signs that you need to look, rethink the way you're scoring leads. Um, and make adjustments accordingly to make sure that um, one, it, digging in to make sure it's it's to see if it's a lead scoring problem or if it's a follow up problem. Or as Deeksha mentioned, like there's always going to be that that bias that comes when we tell you tell our sales team like these leads are are hot, they need to be followed up with the utmost attention versus the ones that might be lower um, on our spectrum and and might not be getting attention. But again, they could they could have some gems in there. 
Um, but yeah, those are, those are the two big ones for, for, for me, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the the conversion metrics are pretty much the same for us. Like you're looking at lead to MQL rate, you're looking at MQL to SQL rate, and then eventually the win rate. Uh, one of the metrics, like we have multiple steps within the funnel that we evaluate. And I, I think one of the things that I'd add on top of this is what we call is a good fit flow rate. So let's say you book a de demo and the demo was done, right? You have certain demos that were a good fit based on an account executive who's working them and some of them that are bad fit. Um, we look at both of them. Sometimes, um, actually most of the time, that is a very good indicator of early on saying the lead scoring or the things that we've gone through the funnel are actually a good fit or not. So while we look at all of them on paper, like constantly when we change the models, like good fit show rate is one of our like key metrics that we hold ourselves accountable to because eventually the idea is you are increasing the MQL2 demo rate or decreasing the MQL demo rate, depending on the path you're taking, the hope is that the good fit show rate of the demos that you've set actually should increase. Um, and that is a good indicator of how your scoring is working or not working. Yeah, really good advice there, really good insight. Um, we're gonna take good time. Um, and if you could just leave our audience with um, some final thoughts, um, what would be a key piece of advice when it comes to, you know, lead scoring and finding your best leads? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd say number one for me is don't try to solve all your problems at once, um, with your scoring model. I think it's called a lead scoring model because it's just that it's a model. It's you're supposed to go back and iterate and reiterate using the data you capture from your existing model to get better over time. Uh, so if you try to solve everything at once, you're going to get stuck in a, in a place where you're not making any decisions and nothing is getting better. Um, yeah. Uh, that's a really good advice, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there are two things, right? One is, uh, be very close to data, like get, get comfortable with looking at data and look at it on, on, on an ongoing basis, but most, most importantly align with sales. It's good to have like quantitative view of your scoring, right? Using the data, but there is a lot of value in getting that qualitative, uh, feedback from your sales team, specifically when you're making those changes. And that could actually help you in either adjusting your model or working with sales to figure out how to enable them to work different leads that you're now sending, which are more aligned with your ICP and the path that you're taking. So look at the data and align with your sales. Those are my final thoughts. Yeah, really good. Appreciate that. Now we have time for questions. So definitely put your questions in the Q&A box if you have any. Um, I have a couple coming through right now. Um, the first one is from John, um, and he wants to know what is the difference between a lead scoring and lead grading, and how can this pairing be used to help determine um, when to send a lead to sales? Do you want to take this one, Dom? Yeah, I can take this one. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm one. I'm not 100 percent certain exactly how they're defining lead scoring and lead grading. But the, when I look at the two, I think lead scoring is is what determines the rate at which leads are being passed to your sales team, um, and the grading is the quality of the lead itself. So you might have a, um, and that's typically, um, I, I would say, is based on like demographic and firmographic data to to determine the grade. So you might have, um, for it, we sell to marketing. So if we have a VP of marketing at a perfect industry fit company, like they might have a lead grade of an A, but if they're not engaging with their content um, or showing any interest in purchasing, their lead score might be low. So I think um, it, it's important to look at both. And I think that's that's why we use firmographic and demographic data as part of that, or as a component of lead scoring, uh, because it's it's not enough just to be a good fit from a sales readiness perspective. There, there needs to be that level of interest and engagement and intent that comes beyond the uh, the grade to really push that to be worthy of sending the sales. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Um, yeah, I think one of them is based on the, you know, the company, the demographic uh, information, and one of them is based on how they're like engaging, right? So. Um, I think eventually it's the pairing of that together is going to give you the most exhaustive model. So it is all dependent on where you are in your like data collection journey and how advanced you are. Sometimes like having like basic information 
um, on lead scoring is enough for you to like get started. But eventually the idea is to have them together working for you to have like the best chances of coming up with a model that works best for you. Yeah, hopefully that helps you, John. Um, and then we do have another one from Melissa. Um, what should be included in a definition of an MQL? For instance, is a lead marketing qualified if they don't demonstrate a clear intent to buy your product or service? Um, go ahead, Tom. No, I was going to say, I was going to let you get this first. <laughs> <laughs> a lead can be marketing qualified if it is not showing that, like that intent that you're talking about, right? Sometimes, um, you know, I can qualify the lead because I feel like this is the right ICP for me. This is the right title for me. And I may want to do some outbound motion to get the, to this, you know, qualified lead and start working them. Um, I think it's good to have that intent because it depends on your sales capacity and what your sales follow back motion is uh, to then figure out what that volume is. But oftentimes when you don't have like, like clear intent and you're trying to hit a number, like you may want to expand beyond just the intent and look at the ICP, look at the industry, look at some of the firmographic as well as the demographic data to say, is that enough for me to kind of demonstrate that as my qualified lead and then just start working them? Um, yeah. Sometimes sales can do more magic than marketing. We try to do everything at our end to kind of get them to the sales ready stage, but sometimes we just have to get the right people in front of the sales team and sales team and let them do the work. Yeah, I, I definitely I agree with Deeksha there. I think like not not every MQL that's passed over is going to have clear intent. If if we uh, if we lived in a world where where that were the case, we wouldn't have as SDR team. Like the the, the SDRs were created because there's not always going to be enough inbound leads to. To do that, but I think the the value of the MQL comes in that if they do have the ICPA fit and they might have some interest, at least in the topic, like that's a much warmer conversation than cold calling someone who has done absolutely nothing to indicate any interest in in your solution or or your top the the pain points your solution solves as a whole. So even if they're not demonstrating a clear intent to buy your products or your service, um, general interest in topics related to that indicate like they're at least they they'll at least be open to a conversation. Um, and SCRs, if if uh, if you're hearing that and saying you don't always get that, I'm I'm sorry, I can't give you a a warm conversation with every lead. Yeah, good point. And actually, that brings us to our next question from from Sarah. And we talked a lot about um, you know how how marketing can communicate with sales, but what if sales is telling marketing that you know despite all this data driven work they're doing. They're, they're not getting the good um, lead quality or they're not connecting with the leads uh, that we're passing over. That is always a constant struggle, right? Like I am spending a lot of time talking to this sales and eventually I think it is, we are also like talking about company resources, right? Like if there are things that sales is pushing back on, like we, we have to take that into consideration to figure out what is working, what is not working, which is kind of what I touched upon, right? Like having that feedback is helpful. Also, sometimes there is, um, you know, the, the, the team that we have, like the sales enablement team, which kind of helps the sales team to kind of have those conversations. It is good to sometimes go back and see like what kind of conversations are they, ha are they having? Are, is there a need from marketing standpoint for us to give them better tools so they're ready for those conversations? Are they getting hit by, I'm not ready for this. Can we get them to a point where we are, sharing more information about like Zoom info in this instance, pushing them back and figuring out not the right time, perhaps the right resource, but maybe in three months. Having all of that information, qualitative information from sales can help us then like go back and say, most of the leads, if you're coming from a specific channel, which we think are ready, are probably not ready. Let's change the scoring for it, put them in nurture, nurture models, get them back to sales and then see if that works. But it's always a, uh, a push and pull like sometimes you know sometimes we we take the brunt of it and say we're going to make adjustments and sometimes i push back push back on sales and say hey like this is the best lead that is possible out there and you guys have to work harder to get them to convert right so having that alignment and having that push back and pull back sometimes can can help you like go through those conversations a little bit easier totally agree on that i i i think it's it's important to emphasize like marketing um just as much as we we are getting feedback to adjust our model from from the sales team like we should be providing feedback to the sales team 
on uh, whether the the level of follow up or the the types of engagements they're doing to follow up on leads are seem up to snuff in terms of like what we'd like to see. I think um, it, it's a two way street for feedback, uh, and you do need to dig into the activities. Uh, we mentioned before the stuff that we think is hot, sales might not think is hot, uh, but just because that's the case, it doesn't mean they should, maybe you just drop them into an email cadence and say, good luck, because you'll never truly see the quality of the lead if that's all you're doing, especially with how how much content goes into people's inbox nowadays. Like you need to have multi-touch approach to follow up. Um, and the other piece is just understanding why it's not working. Um, is it not working because we're having conversations and they're telling us no, in which case, okay, maybe there are some adjustments to the lead score model um, that, that need to be made, or it could also be a talk track or an objection handling discussion as well, depending on what those conversations actually look like. Um, or is it they're, they're just not able to get anybody on the line? Um, and from that standpoint, that's it's a little easier to solve because you do have tools like Zoom Info where you can get, let's get some direct dials and mobile phones and make sure that we're having conversations as frequently as possible. Um, to get a, the, a true sense of the quality of the leads versus, uh, again, just dropping them in an email drip and hoping someone responds. So, um, yeah, said short, I think like the discourse, there's needs to be a healthy discourse between sales and marketing where both sides are checking the other on the scoring model, the follow up, and what the engagements actually look like um, after the lead is passed. Yeah, cool. Thank you. And I think we have one time for one more question. So, this one is from Roger. Um, he says, I just implemented marketing automation at the beginning of the year. Um, in our next phase, we're going to be um, defining our lead scoring model. Uh, do you have any advice of like how we should start and how we should prepare sales? First implementation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I brought up before, like you take advantage of whatever historical data you have, like, um, if you don't have anything yet, like you're going to have to use your ops, you're going to have to use the leads that have already been coming in to kind of inform yourself on what's what's working as it currently stands. Um, and as I stated, for my my final note is you need to deploy something um, and, and it should be as data driven as possible, but your goal isn't to create a completed product. Your goal is to get to a place where you can start making adjustments and refine it. So um, that's what I'd say is, is analyze your close your, your close one ops from the last like year or two take a look at the inbound leads that you're you're having coming into your system already um and and use those to to inform your model a little bit to start um and then i think with with a brand new lead scoring model like this is something you have to keep a much closer eye on because you don't have you can't rely on on the historical successes that you've already had here like you're everything starting from the beginning so you should be monitoring that like at at da daily at best or at, at least um, but like even looking as leads come in, kind of doing them one by one, assuming you're not pulling in like 2000 leads at a time, if you are, congrats. Um, <laughs> but uh, monitoring those as, as, as leads come in and, and getting getting in the weeds, like you just have to get in the weeds with that. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. Like, I think the first thing about all of this is to get started with scoring. So you're already there. You're already thinking about it. So that that's great. Um and then I think there are different methodologies you can use. Figure out what is the customer journey that you're putting your uh, leads on. And based on your best guess of these are the specific kinds of emails that I'm doing, these are the different actions that they will, they will take, or these are the different pushes that I'm going to do, and these are the different actions they can potentially take. Try to like model that, try to kind of flow chart it or kind of create a path for it to say, based on these paths, what seems like the right starting point? It's always good to start a little bit wider so you can collect that data to come like really tight. But each one of them has its pros and cons, right? If you start small and you can be really targeted and have learnings, you can always expand. If your sales team has capacity and if you can start wide, then collecting that extra uh, data can help you like really focus in on specific areas that you know are working and adjust the scoring for it. Um, but at any of these things, like having that flow of how the customer journey would look like, what seems like the right touch points for you to score um, would be helpful. And uh, yeah, like I feel like that if you couple it with, with uh, you know, certain, certain personas, right? If you have a director and above coming, which is a really good and have not done as much activity, maybe you want to drop the thresholds. But if you have some individual contributors coming, they, you want to increase the threshold. So depending on how you're doing it, you may want to tweak it differently to perhaps like one or two extra things outside of just the touch points that they're doing to make sure that you have a shot at really pulling something together, which could have like a scalable outcome. 
Yeah. Yep. Hopefully, Hopefully that's, that was that's helpful. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, that was our last question. And um, conveniently, we're also about time for today. Uh, so I just want to say um, thank you for joining us and for all the great questions that came in again, um, and also our awesome presenters, Dom and Deeksha. And lastly, a big thank you to the Zoom info team for co-presenting today. Uh, just going to end with a friendly reminder that we'll be sending the slide deck and on-demand recording in the next two days. So please keep an eye out. Uh, we definitely want you to share all of these resources um, with your colleagues. So hope you have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.